And we're back, Stripe Show Podcast, on a Thursday. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thank you for uh, tuning in. We're back, Instruction Thursday. In the month of May, the sun is out. It's time to play some golf, not only in the United States, but even to our friends up north in Canada. My man is back, Shaheen Nakjavani. How you doing, buddy? Good. Season is finally rolling on over here, so pretty excited to be coaching outdoors again. Uh, it's about 50, 60 degrees Fahrenheit right yes. now, which honestly is not too bad. Good, decent yes. golf and weather. Let's do it, right? 50 yeah. degrees, 60 degrees. I can remember growing up, Pacific Northwest, Northern Idaho, 50 degrees. Early May it was awesome. Man, I was out there in shorts. Yeah, you know, it, definitely, it, it definitely feels like 80 for us because of where we came from. <laughs> How excited are Canadians for the President's Cup? I think they're excited. I think that, um, you know, the difference with us versus everyone else is we only get one big tournament every like seven years, eight years. I mean, the Canadian Open only really comes back. You know, the last time it was here was, I think, like 2014 or 12 or something like that. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. So uh, they definitely are pretty excited. Uh, I'm actually going to be at Royal Montreal this weekend, the host site of the event with uh, one of my tour players coming into town. So I'm okay. actually excited to see kind of the development of where the course is at at the moment. Hey, congrats with uh, Stephen Ames, by the way. You're doing a, a great job with him. He's playing some terrific golf there on the uh, on the Champions Tour. Not surprise, Shaheen, one of the top teachers in the world and uh, always a frequent guest. We appreciate your time, man, um, coming back here on the podcast. And you were the first guy that I thought of when I, I you know, sometimes, you know, you're always kind of making posts here and there and you sometimes you, you make a post and you're like wow this will this will get a lot of reaction and this and that and it's like crickets and then every once in a while you just throw one out there and you're surprised you know that it kind of strikes a nerve you know with some people and they want to comment on it and maybe they want to learn a little bit more about it and this was the case with this picture that i sent out on twitter and instagram mm -hmm. and i i put these six up and those that are listening right now uh, check it out if you're on social, on Twitter, at Travis Fulton. And you'll see I, the six pictures are John Rahm, Ro uh, Victor Hovland, Colin Morikawa, Rory McIlroy, Scotty Scheffler, and Justin Thomas. And it's a picture of an iron swing, and the camera angles are pretty close. So it's it's a good view of these six at the top of the swing. And they all look different. And I said, look, if you had to pick, to the amateur audience, if you had to pick, one of these six to be your position at the top of the swing to play golf from for the rest of your life, which of these six would you pick? And as expected, it was a pretty wide range, right, of people um, of, of who they pick. And, and, and I got a lot of response, um, you know, on Twitter and Instagram, and I got a lot of DMs too. And that's when I know it kind of strikes a chord when I get all these DMs coming in and, well, here's what I would pick and why. And what do you think? You know, I was like, you know what? All right, we're going to do a podcast on it. We're going to do a podcast on this. We're going to talk about it. We're going to break it down. Shaheen's the perfect guy for it. So you look at these six and you watch and you look at the response, Shane. What's the first thing that kind of comes to mind, you know, as we kind of dive into this, when you look at these six, would you pick one for you personally for the rest of your life? I would. And it's the same answer I would pick for the everyday golfer, um, okay. which which I'll get into in a second. But ironically enough, the first thing that stood out to me is there's a lot of world number ones or ex world number ones here with extremely different patterns. So obviously, <laughs> obviously, this is going to be a very polarizing photo just because of the fact that so many of these players have achieved incredible amounts of success with matching positions that aren't even remotely close, like the matchups yeah. aren't even remotely similar. So, um, yeah, I mean, I can say my answer right away if you want. I can sure. hold it Let's off. See it. I mean, what is it? I mean, I would take Rory. I think it's pretty clear that Rory okay. for the everyday golfer would have the best position uh, for a wide range of reasons. You know, primarily when you look at the average golfer and what they struggle with, most of them are going to struggle with slicing. Most of them are going to struggle with uh, lack of compression. You know, the one thing that Rory does really well, better than most of the other players in this in that photo of six is he's got a better pelvic tilt he's got a better turn to the hips you know you can see a pretty 
dramatic change in knee flex there. His left knee obviously mm -hmm. is flexing down a lot at the top of the backswing. Right leg stays somewhat extended. It retains a bit of bend. That's pretty common, but it's not, you know, overly flexed. Uh, and his right pocket works behind him pretty well, so he is utilizing his legs quite, quite functionally. But also his hands get pretty far behind him at the top, which, as I'm sure you come across literally every single day on your lesson tee, most recreational golfers don't turn into their hips very well. The lead arm, the hand path gets way too high in the backswing. Now, is that okay for the pro golfer? For sure. They're the outliers of the world. They can make anything work for various reasons, which we'll get into. The everyday golfer usually is going to struggle with a club that comes down way too steep when that's the case. Rory is a prime example of where the average golfer would benefit from, having the left arm a little bit more across the chest, a little bit deeper, as we would call it. Uh, club is... In this picture, a little bit more laid off. In my opinion, this is when he plays his best. When he struggles specifically, you tend to see a little bit more cup to the wrist and the shaft get a little bit more across the line. Um, for a shorter pattern, when it's a little laid off, it tends to be a little easier to keep the club shallow coming down, strike it from the inside, all the good things, you know. Let me let me let me follow up on that because you make a really good mm -hmm. observation. This is actually a picture of Rory. Um, I think it's back in 2017. Okay. Yeah. And I picked it specifically because Rory is actually a little more vertical right there. A to your point, a little more cup across the line. And as Rory has over the last year or two kind of struggled with some of his wedge game, hitting a lot of these pulls to the left, et cetera, et cetera. And when I say struggle, that's <laughs> relatively yeah. speaking for Rory, Relative, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, and so, but a high high class or you know a world class player like Roy McIlroy, like some of the misses that he's had is is pretty alarming, right? With with some of the shorter irons. With that said, I took a picture of this and then a, a recent picture of Rory, and I put them side by side and I sent it to someone at Golf Channel that I know really well. And he, I said, it, it seems pretty evident to me, like what the difference is, right? Like between these two and where maybe Rory needs to go. And this is when he was seeking out help with Butch Harmon, et cetera. And so I said, why doesn't he just rotate it a little bit more and get the shaft pointing just a bit more left? I mean, that just seems, you know, logical at this point. It'd be a little easier to get the club back down and control the face and kind of eliminate some of those poles. And he said, you know, I asked him that and he says, he can't physically get there anymore. He can't physically get to this position anymore. And I was like, wow, I just, I'm not sure I buy that. You know, like I'm not, I'm not sure I actually really buy that explanation, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. I tend to agree with you. I think there, there's kind of a one and one A for me, and we'll get into it. I think Rory, this position, yeah, is probably the one that I would pick, and for a lot of the same reasons as you. Let me ask you this: Do you ever take an amateur and set the set a mirror to the right of him? So, like Rory right now, you know, if he looked to his right, there would be a mirror. And you, and you get him up to the top and you say, hey, go up to the top, look to the right in the mirror, and I want you to see a little window in there between your knees. I want to see a little space in there. Because we get a little space, we get a change in knee flex, that right hip's working a little deeper. Do you ever do that? That Because that seems to that seems to register with a lot of amateurs when you're trying to get them to turn that right side of the pelvis up a little bit, lose a little flexion. Give me a little window in there like Rory. Yeah, so many ways to do it. I mean, I think mirrors in general are super helpful, especially because a lot of players – especially higher handicaps, they don't have the best sense of awareness of what's happening internally. Like they can't really feel the changes a lot, or even if they do, sometimes a very subtle change feels very dramatic to them. So it's good to have a mirror there in the background, in this case, let's say down the line for, for Rory, where they can visually see the change. I'm also a big advocate of like, you can throw an alignment stick between the, like inside the belt loops in front of them. And mm -hmm. in theory, when the knees change flex, the hips are getting to different heights. So the left hip, in his case, the front hip is going down. The back hip is coming up a little bit. So that would tilt the pelvis in a way where if you had a stick across your belt loops, it would be inclined more towards the ground. Whereas when golfers retain too much of a similar flex on both knees, they're not creating that window that you're referring to. The stick would turn very level. It would stay parallel to the ground for way too long. The other thing I like about this is you mentioned the lead arm depth, right? Um, mm -hmm. Rory, if anything, probably can, you know, he probably gets it a little deep at times and you see him at times For like sure. trying to get the hand, trying to get the hands a little higher and which would kind of help facilitate, maybe lay the shaft down just a little bit. But I also like what I'll do with the mirror is, is I'll have him look to the right and I'll say, now, look, can you see the club face? 
is the club face looking at the mirror. And, and so many times, of course, you know, a player who rotates the face back and they get it too open and then they're always trying to compensate between the grip and the wrist angle and kind of teaching them the nuance of that, of getting the face to kind of look back towards the mirror a little bit, which then they start to calibrate what that feels like and the integrity of the shaft. And all of a sudden now they've really got something right at the top of the swing shafts relatively on plane face is not open. And now development can <laughs> in so many ways start to happen. This is, this is kind of what I think about backswing work. Okay. I think number mm -hmm. one, you want to try to put recreational golfers into a position where organically good things are likely to happen. It's never a guarantee because you don't know how people move in transition and coming into the ball. Right. But even if they move poorly, if you get them into a good enough spot on the backswing, it can, to some degree, offset bad movements in transition to keep them in a good place. Mm -hmm. If a player has the hands really high and then the hands kick out aggressively in transition, they're going to get so far out in front of the body, the golfer is going to hit two down and across the ball. They're going to slice it or hit major pulls. If you get their hands much more across their chest, even if they had some sort of bad sequence to the chest in transition and it kicked out, there's a lot more space before they get into a really penalizing position to where the golfer's path wouldn't be compromised nearly as much, which is why I believe backswing changes are, are crucial. And mm -hmm. honestly, recreational golfers find it very hard to make changes to the downswing. Everything's happening and traveling so fast. If you can get them to do something different on the way back, which is a lot easier and a lot slower for most people, usually good things are going to happen and it's a lot more easily transferable to the golf course. That's why I'm, I'm a big believer of that. Now in Rory's case, kind of, as you mentioned, right? Like his left arm can get too far across his chest. I also think in his case, it's, it's uh, much more problematic subjectively to him because he has such a big lateral move in transition that his hands always have had this like big drop to them because of how much mm -hmm. he shifts laterally. If his hands are already too deep and then he shifts laterally, they're going to drop even more from the inside he has the opposite problem. The hands get stuck inside and then he has to save it at the bottom. And that's another yeah. issue in itself. Which, you know, we could go, we could go down this rabbit hole forever, right? And yeah, really yeah, start talking. <laughs> but, sure. but I think this is really well illustrated on and why, you know, we would maybe pick Rory for ourselves and, and not just for ourselves, but just for the amateur player, right? And, and, and the average handicap, the male 16.1. Um, there's a lot of 20 handicaps listening to this. There's a lot of 12 handicaps listening to this. There's a lot of, you know, maybe five or six handicaps listening to this. And, and, and you're starting to think about, okay, what does my backswing look like? And then what am I incentivized to do from there based off that pattern? And if I change it, will that breed development, change the probability of impact and elevate my ceiling in a way that I can develop more skill, right? That's kind of what we're after here. So, that's that's Rory. Now, let's go back to this. Your least, examples. your least favorite Shaheen for the amateur player. I could probably name you three that I think equally I'm wow. not crazy about. Okay, pick I one for say, me. Okay, um, honestly, probably Colin Morikawa. Okay, let's bring Colin in. And this is not a shot at Colin. Again, this is very specifically relating this to the everyday golfer, not to tour players, because I work with tour players who have a wide range of swings that I'm not crazy about, but that they can make it work at a high level. Sure. Um, obviously, lower half is the complete opposite of Rory. He's got virtually no hip turn. Uh, his knees retain this virtually the same amount of flex on both legs. There's none of that window. Now, that's not even the biggest reason why I'm not a fan of it, although it's a big part of it. When you don't turn the hips that much, but you turn the upper body as much as he does, you are creating such a big separation between the upper and the lower half that, in my opinion, that builds a lot of tension that the recreational golfer simply cannot sustain for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So it's not even a shot I called in. He's obviously in incredible shape and he can do this. The recreational golfer cannot, for starting. Number two, Colin Morikawa's grip is extremely weak. He's able to offset that and keep the club face in a good enough position through obviously the, the amount of flexion that he has to the wrist. Now, obviously, we have talked about this at length of why it's beneficial to have some element of a bow or feel of that nature to get the club face close for everyday golfers. But 
because Colin's grip is so weak, it requires so much wrist mobility to get so bowed at the top to keep the club face square. I do not believe the recreational golfer has the ability to support that much mobility in the wrist joint. I haven't seen it on my lesson tee that much, right? So now it's a question of can the everyday golfer long-term sustain the physical tension that is being put on the body, in my opinion, in two different areas where the average golfer, with all due respect, is in much worse shape than Colin is, right? And so not the craziest about that. I also believe because of the lack of hip turn, his lead arm isn't at nearly as deep as Rory's. It's also liable to come down a lot steeper into the ball. His left arm does get very far out in front of him, Colin, right? He does tend to favor more of a fade. And people love his golf swing. I get it. But he has a lot of very unique matchups that makes it work that I just don't think are are easy to be consistent with if you're practicing once every two weeks and playing golf once a week, mm. put it that way. Okay, so let me let me get into that. So where Colin and Rory are different, because the club face, all intents and purposes, are pretty close at the top. Yeah, completely um, different grips and wrist angles to get there, but the, yeah. the matchups get the club face in similar positions, for sure. R right, yeah. And, and Colin, his left arm, to your point, is a little more upright. Mm -hmm. A lot more upright, really. Um, his grip is weaker. Uh, and weaker, just real quick, left thumb more down the middle. Uh, Rory's probably got his left thumb a little to the right. He's seeing a couple more knuckles with that little stronger grip for Rory. He's taking on a little more extension in the left wrist. Colin, weaker grip, taking on a little more flexion in the left wrist. Um, and so this flexion in the left wrist, right? Um, you hear that a lot. You see it a lot. I wonder, did you see Brandel Chambly's tweet about it? I feel like I have, but feel free to refresh my memory. I'll read it to you, okay? Because I think it's appropriate here with as we look at Colin, and then I'll let mm -hmm. you react to it. So this was uh, a couple days ago, I think. And Brandel says, a lot of talk amongst teachers or amongst the teaching world about bowed left wrist, shut faces. Not so much a shut face here. We'll get to a shut face here in a second. Yeah. Um, massive transitional drops, no lateral hip slide and massive rotation extension through the ball because the teaching world loves fads, which I understand they sell. But the most important aspect of this game is iron play and the very best iron players uh, don't do these things, kind of referring to Tiger, um, Adam Scott, Scotty Scheffler, which we'll get to here in a second. And so this, you know, kind of this fad and, you know, Kool-Aid, I guess, in some regards that we see, flex the lead wrist, bow the lead wrist, get the face more, or actually get the face shut, um, is it over taught? And, and do you think right now um, in the world of uh, social media? No, not even remotely close. I yeah. would argue that Brandel, I don't want to be negative in any way. I think he's extremely intelligent, but he mm -hmm. to some degree lives in this fishbowl of per the pro golf world. He sees the best players in the world who are the 0.1 of the 0.1 of the 0.1% of players in the world. And then he's trying to get everybody to do what these guys are doing without understanding that there is a massive skill component to the game that these players have that the recreational golfer will never have. Right. What we see you, I, and these coaches on social media, which I, I, I remember reading through some of the replies, a lot of them were very insulting of social media coaches. What we actually see is the golfer who comes in, just wants to impress his father-in-law, just wants to go out and break 80, just wants to find a way to keep the ball in front of them and gain a little bit more distance. There is no doubt in my mind you're able to do that through the many things that he disagrees with. Getting the club a little bit stronger, getting the shaft a little bit shallower, getting a little bit more rotation through the ball. These things are extremely beneficial for most golfers, right? So separating teaching tour players and teaching recreational golfers is crucial in this argument because you do yes. not teach them the same. Yeah. I have done the complete opposite with Stephen Ames that I have done with everybody else. I've tried to get his left arm at the beginning a little bit less across his chest. I tried to get his club face less shut. He actually used to be too stuck and too shallow from the inside. I have done everything to steepen his pattern to offset too much draw curve. Mm-hmm. 
I don't do that nearly that often on my lesson fee. Now, of course, I do every once in a while, but that's not the bulk of my lessons that I'm giving. It's not the bulk of lessons you're giving. Yeah. The average handicap you just said is 16. Do you think these 16 handicaps are coming in with pretty shallow moves through the ball? Probably not, right? So I don't disagree with him when we are talking about the best players in the world. I strongly disagree with him when we're talking about recreational golfers, which let's be real, when I'm posting something or you're posting something on social media, the masses that are seeing this video are pretty poor golfers. They're not you know, tour players. Now, a tour player might come across your video. That's fine. But those are not the bulk of the people watching the video. So the the audience that you are delivering this information to is not the same type of people that Brandel is obsessed with analyzing. And that's, I think, where the mistake or where the confusion often comes in. I think that's really well said. And I think Brandel would agree with that. Knowing Brandel, I think he would, he would, uh, he would agree with that. I, I don't disagree with him also when in the world of professional golf, elite players. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that there's an argument to be made there, but I agree when developing amateurs, I call it Shaheen, the 85%. I think much of my career, I've been speaking to the 85% and the 85% are the people that don't show up on your lesson tee, okay? 15% are going to show up on your lesson tee, or they're going to take an online lesson from you, or buy a training program, or, you know, something. Mm -hmm. But we know 85%, and that might be low, are not going to spend money in a one-on-one -on -one lesson. They're not going to do it. And so for much of my career, I find myself thinking about those people whether if I was when I was on Golf Channel or my platforms or the podcasts, and I know those patterns, <laughs> you know, like I know what those patterns are. I've seen them for 24 years. And so I know those 85% are like the 15% showing up, if not a little worse, right? And so do we see too much of the face open or closed? We probably see it. I see it still a little more open. Not as much as I did 15 years ago, but still probably a little open. Um, I would argue that answer is dependent on where you are in your golf journey as a coach. Yes. Well, yeah, for sure. Just in general. Let's just go general. Yeah. Um, do you see the club head too far inside in the initial move or too far outside? Yeah. Way too far right. inside in the takeaway. I see, see it way too time. far inside. Yeah, I mean, I see yeah. it like it's it's all the time. I see it every uh, time I film my video of my own golf swing. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yes. Um, do you see the left arm too flat or too upright? Yeah, more right. often too upright, and I would argue, if anything, sometimes too flat to a point of penalty, which is crazy. Yeah. Do you see the shaft? too shallow or too steep coming down, right? I mean, like, you start going through the checklist. I mean, I know what your answers are. And, and, and like, mm -hmm. so can, can getting more flexion in the lead wrist and getting the face a little bit more shut going back for the masses, I know it's not for everybody, but for the masses, can it do a lot of good to the pitch of the shaft, preparing the club face early and opening up the door for development subconsciously? subconsciously and i love the word you always say incentivize the player yeah. on the downswing and through impact and so for me that's where yeah like i more times than not i'm probably going to give them a little bit of morikawa in the left wrist feel he they, they're not going to get there i don't want them to get there but they probably going to feel a little more of that right so, so that's a big confusion too, right? Is oftentimes yeah. when we're referring to getting more bow, we could be talking about just going from very cupped to a flat position. It doesn't ever most necessarily of the time. even need. I mean, first of all, we no. kind of said it from the beginning of this. I don't think most golfers can even sustain getting to where Colin is. But secondly, it doesn't mean we want them to necessarily get there. We just want them to feel and have that visual in their mind to move away from something that's the complete opposite. I can tell you right now, I can't get in this position. We're moving on to the third swing, which is Victor Hovland. Um, this is when mm -hmm. he was working with Jeff Smith, who's been on the podcast a couple times. And, and Jeff, him and I, you know, we, we exchanged texts once in a while. He came and saw me when he was in the players. I'm a huge fan of Jeff. Um, and I told him, I said, 
I, I put my hack motion wrist sensor on and I tried to get my left wrist in this position and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I, can't, I could not physically get my left wrist in this condition um, at the top of the swing and hold on to the club. I could do it without the club, but I couldn't do it with the club holding it and do that. So Victor, of course, when we look at this, um, you know, I, his left wrist is, is very flexed at the top of the swing. Um, we can now see even more of the face, right, looking back at us. So it's a little more shut to the point that we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah. You know, for the masses, again, this is Hovland unique, but for the masses, where do you, where do you rank this one? Uh, probably somewhere in the middle of all those okay. videos that I saw. You know, I, I think there's a lot of good here. Obviously, the, the tilt of the pelvis is good. He doesn't actually have as much hip turn as he lets on just because of the fact that the knees are changing a lot of flex. If you actually look at the right pocket, it doesn't get super deep behind him. So he does have turn. He doesn't have the same range of motion as some other players. Um, you know, the thing that makes Victor Hovland somewhat of a freak athlete is that he doesn't just have a lot of bow to the wrist. He also keeps his forearms very shut at the top of the mm -hmm. backswing. Mm -hmm. And if you've, if you've ever tried to not only bow your wrist, but then bow your wrist and then rotate your forearm very closed. So Can't like to it. your to your left, for your left arm, like that's extremely difficult to do. I might be able to get in that position once. The ball's probably going to snap hook off the planet and I'll never do it again, you know. Mm -hmm. Um Victor has a very unique combination of movements as well. His left arm is very upright, which I actually think helps him because he shallows. When your wrist is that flat and your forearms are closed that much at the top, they're going to naturally react and go the other way in transition, meaning yeah. his yeah. forearm is going to rotate to his right pretty dramatically yeah. coming down, which is a massive shallowing move to the club. You need to find a way when you're going to shallow the club that much not to let it get stuck a mile behind you. His left arm being higher is a big reason for that. On top of the fact that he rotates incredibly well through the ball as well to, to offset that pattern. I got to tell you, man, I, I see a lot of people in this studio and online that will take the club head. They'll get it kind of sucked inside a little bit. They'll rotate that. They'll rotate that left form excessively. They'll get the shaft laid off and they'll get the face borderline open, which for me is like a double whammy, right? Like it's just now we've got so much work to do. Yeah. And I will use this Victor Hovland. And I will give you just exactly what you said, you know, maybe get them to feel a little bit of just a little, not, not like this. Again, I'm, they're, I'm getting them to feel a little bit more flexion. I'm not, they're not flex. They're just feeling more flexion. Yeah. But I will get them to feel like the back of the left hand will turn a little bit away from them. And again, not to this degree with a little more lead arm depth <laughs> for most. Right. Yeah. And they, will hit the ball instantly better than they've ever hit it. instantly. It's, it's crazy how good, and I'm talking about a specific pattern here, kind of suck it in a little bit, really rotate the shaft, get it laid off, little left wrist gets a little cuppy, faces, you know, hanging a bit open. And, you know, and like that player kind of, a lot of them can manage it decent. Like they can, you know, it'll steepen a little, but not a ton. And then they'll kind of let out the shaft a little and, um, and they'll hit it pretty straight. I mean, they'll clank it on the toe some, but it's like, you know, they're not, it's not bad. Yeah. But, but then I'll change that backswing pattern. I'll get them to feel Vic and they'll feel like, damn, that club's across the line. I was like, well, not really like that it's face feels it's, shut. It's, it's barely in line, but it feels way across. And then they'll change direction. You know what happens to that shaft? It shells out for the first time. Yep. You see that? Do you see that pattern? I, I get golfers to shallow the club so often by just getting them to feel more across the line, believe it or not, because they get Thank so late, they get so laid off at the top. Thank you. That even if I don't even tell them anything with the forearms to get it across the line, their forearms are naturally going to have to move differently to get it into that position. They have to. And because it's going to feel so extreme to them, guess what they're going to do in transition to offset what that feels so extreme? Whoop. They're going to go the other way with the forearm and the club shallows on its own. I, I would argue that's Get the hands deeper, get the club more across the line. You'll solve 80% of steep clubs coming down. <laughs> right. It's funny. I, I posted that a couple months ago. I put one across the line, got the face touch shut. The other one laid off, face touch open. Which one you want? And 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 I'm telling you, the majority went, well, I want the shaft a little over there with the face. I'm like, no, you don't. Not for the masses. Now I get it. Like for some, like, like you're not going to do that. But I said for the masses, no way. No way. Give me a little cross the line with the face shut, a little lead arm depth. Off we go. 
it's, it's amazing to me how much bad information there still is on the internet about stuff like this. That's like we prove it every single day when we teach. All right. We're three down, three to go. Take me somewhere. What's on your mind? We got so who do we got left here for our audience? Listen, we got John Rom who's flexed and laid off. We got yeah. we got Scotty who's a little extended and more across the line, and then we got JT super upright. Let's go, Scotty. I mean, world number one. Okay. Why not? We kind of have to, right? Love it. Let's do it. It's really nice of him to actually give the uh, the field a chance to win again this week. <laughs> how generous! <laughs> how generous of him! All right, there he is, Scotty Scheffler, world number one, top of the swing. A little different than uh, what we just saw with with Vic. Talk to me about this one, bud. I mean, swing is obviously a lot longer and more across. Probably, honestly, maybe number two on my list of where I would put a recreational golfer. Me too. Yeah. Even though there's, you know, the left wrist maybe trends a little bit cupped, obviously at the top, but the club is. Much longer, more across the line. I like the bigger turn. There's a lot of space to get the club shallow. Even if you can't from there, it would be pretty easy to do. Um, you know, the trail arm is a little flying, that elbow, which most recreational golfers can support because they don't have crazy shoulder mobility. Anyways, uh, if I had to take an everyday golfer and give them the best chance to succeed, this is yeah, probably number two on my list personally. We've had this conversation before. Um, I think your answer is similar to mine that you're lengthening out a lot of amateurs as they get older. Um, Way more, more than, than shortening. Yeah, okay. for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think Scotty's a good image of that, right? Kind of lengthening out. Now, he's not doing it a lot with his change of knee flex and hips and those kinds of mm -hmm. things. He he seems very mobile in his upper body, in his spine. Yeah. And and so, but I love the 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 completion of the backswing, right? And, you know, realist, you know, some, some, uh, solid, relatively solid lead arm depth. Um, I think Scotty and talking to his coach, Randy Smith, who's been on the pod a couple of times, I get the idea at times Scotty will get a little too much toe hang at the top. And so yeah. I think what they always manage to some degree is to make sure the face doesn't get too open. Um, now let's talk about that face angle at the top for a second. Because Scotty can sling it up in the air, right? And his club face is not as closed as we saw with Vic. So when he come when he comes down into impact, his shaft lean, right, is probably not going to be as great as you would see with with Victor Hovland. And the very specific reason for that is because shaft lean typically is going to push the face more open. If the face is already open, you can't really do it. Right. Now, there's a time, right, in the development of an amateur player where you might go through a journey where, like we just talked about to this point, where you're like, you're going to get the face a little bit more closed. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason for that is going to start incentivizing them to shallow it out, to swing more from the inside for the first time. It starts incentivizing them to get some shaft lean for the first time. Now, it, it can get to a point where all of a sudden, through that journey, they might start to overhook it. And as they go through that journey, and I've seen it, you know, thousands of times over the years, they're like, man, I'm so much better a player today than I was yesterday. And the reason is because of what we just talked about right there. And then they're like, okay, there's a time where we might then start to back off of that, right? And maybe start to open the face a bit more um, at the top, whether through the grip or the wrist angle when, when the time's right. Yeah, and honestly, if we're looking at the top half of this move, yeah, it's a, maybe a little long, a little across, a hair of toe hang, but there is all the space in the world here to get the club rerouting into a shallow position, which mm -hmm. most people would benefit from. Um, and, you know, his face maybe trends a little bit more open, but to be completely honest, his club moves extremely well in transition. Everybody obsesses over Scotty's feet because it's such a unique move. But mm -hmm. if you actually look at his arm structure, both at the top and then coming down, he actually moves the club incredibly well. And I think it gets lost in the fact that people obsess over the, what's happening with the lower half. Mm -hmm. The club face is a huge part of development, right? And as a, as a coach, when you're evaluating players and you're looking at amateurs, for me, I'm looking at the club face, probably number one. I'm like, what is what is the club face doing in the swing? And, and is it in position for me to take this student where I want to take him, 
right? And what I feel like they need to learn how to do. And if it's not, then I'm going to, I'm going to change face, right? Whether I'm going to close it or open it more. And if a player comes in and the club face looks like that and the downswing and the impact are working pretty good, well, then we're probably going to leave the club face alone, right? Um, but if it's borderline open and they're steep and they've got throwaway at the bottom, et cetera, et cetera, then, then we probably got to go to the club face, right? So it's like, can a player do what they want to do and develop and get to where they want to get um, with the club face that they have. And that's what I kind of encouraged people a few weeks ago. I was like, when you go into this year, like what is your club face doing? What does a club face look like going back? And then what does it mean to your swing coming down and through impact? And if the club face is an issue, you've got to fix, you got to, you got to fix club face because that's going to open up the door for development is that did i articulate that in a way that makes sense yeah of course i mean at the end of the day your body the first thing it's going to react to is the face angle because the yeah. face angle influences the start line it influences the loft which influences the trajectory and spin so everything is getting affected by that one variable probably more than anything else so your body if it feels like that variable is out of position it's going to do things drastically different right yeah and yeah we talked about incentivizing it's not only in a good way sometimes you're forced to do things in a negative way to compensate for a problem so yeah um i definitely think that getting the club face in a functional position for whatever like your intention is and how everything moves is pretty crucial if i got a player with the face of borderline open at the top and i've got to get now if i don't leave it if i just leave the face alone and i got to teach them how to shallow it and hit it with shaffling an amateur player <laughs> I'm not sure I have the studio behind me. I don't think I, I mean, that's, that's a big ask, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a big ask for, for that skill player. Right. That's a big ask for them to, for them to do that. So it's like, I got to go to the face to help me then create the environment for them to do that. It's an interesting conversation, but the club face is huge. Um, and Scotty, even Scotty will get a little too much toe hang. I think he'd be very happy with that position there. I think that's kind of where they want it to be. Um, but yeah, the completion of this, and I think the reason why it's number two in our list is that for an amateur player to be able to kind of get lengthened out in the backswing, and and for most, they they probably need to recruit more from their lower body. Um, boy, that 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 goes a long, long ways. One of the guys, real quick, before we get to the next one. Is this guy mm -hmm. here's here's a guy that that I think is benefiting from the completion of that right now. Sahith. That picture on the right, I watched him practice at TPC in March. And I gotta tell you something, man. Like that's a pretty big difference right there. That's a pretty big difference. And Sahith has really completed his backswing more. He's got the club more across the line, more complete in the turn, um, not borderline laid off. And I think his driver, Shaheen, and I don't know this, I haven't talked to Sith, but I think his driver has benefited from this right here more than more than anything. Well, I'll relate this to another player. I'm pretty sure I saw Xander working Xander, on something yeah. very similar this year. Yep. You know, when your club gets that laid off at the top with that pattern, odds are to shallow that thing out, you're going to create a lot of right side bend coming down, mm -hmm. sometimes too much of it. And that can get the club stuck really behind you and it becomes really easy to sling it but hard to control start line and minimize the curve right yeah and that's something that i've seen from both of these players so lengthening that out of course is beneficial for sequence and for timing and for a variety of reasons but i also think it actually helps the club movement which helps their body move differently through the ball hmm. it's a domino effect that takes place that begins with where the club's getting aligned at the top yeah that's good stuff that's good stuff all right we got two to go Mm -hmm. I'm going to take us because we're talking a little, um, talking a little laid off right mm -hmm. at the top. So, well, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Mr. John Rom. I mean, how different is this than Scotty? My God. Right. And this is where the conversation comes in. Well, John Rom's here and Scotty's there. The only thing that matters is impact guys. That's it. That They demonstrate that. And that's where the discussion just, I think that's where the discussion kind of goes into our point with Brandel's statement is that, yeah, there's a discussion around the most elite players in the world. 
And then there's a discussion, a very different discussion around developing amateur golfers. And for me, and particularly the 85%. And so if I'm teaching that, if that's my, if this is where I'm going to hang my hat, <laughs> I mean, wow, I'm going to get my, um, with all due respect, I'm going to get my real estate license right now. Yeah, I wouldn't even make contact with the ball solidly from there, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, what's important to note here is not even just the position, but also how he gets there. Mm -hmm. You know, left arm works so out and away from him really early, gets very up and in front of his body. He has a lot of forearm roll in the backswing, which is a big reason why his club obviously gets very laid off in combination with how bowed his wrist is. Um, the truth is, from this position here, it might seem easier to keep the club in a shallow spot, but odds are when these hands start dropping, that shaft is going to steepen immensely. Mm -hmm. And most higher handicap golfers, most amateur golfers are going to struggle big time from a club that steepens that much coming down. And that's either going to cause them to pull it. It's really easy to pull down on the handle when it's as laid off as that is. Mm -hmm. Not something I'm crazy about. And just in general, not... Put it this way, the whole idea of like, why do we like one backswing over the other is what we said, right? Like, I wanted to organically help the player coming down. If the club's in a position where it's basically maxed out how shallow it can get, guess what's going to happen starting down? It's going to work out in front mm -hmm. of the body real fast, way too vertical and in front of you. And this is the case with John. John manages it much better than most. The shaft actually does steepen in transition to some degree. It doesn't happen. Some, a little bit, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it doesn't happen. Yeah, of course. And it doesn't happen as much as probably the everyday golfer from that same position would do just from right. the nature of how they would move. But, you know, just because he's able to do it doesn't mean the everyday golfer is able to do it. And you just have very little room to do good things coming down from there, which is why I'm not crazy about it. Yeah. Number one reason an amateur clanks it off the toe is that little, would you say, is some of the steepening move coming down? Steepening and working too far left through the ball, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not yeah. A, this not, is a hit. Not not, I, yeah. I think the genius of John Rom is how he manages that right there. And again, this is no, um, you know, this is no insult to John Rom. Like we're talking about one of the best players on the planet for the last mm -hmm. five to 10 years. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's, we're just purely speaking in the form of like, would an amateur golfer hit the ball solely from here? I personally do not believe that would be the case in probably 95% of the players that would try to recreate this. Do you do you have any things through your career, Shaheen, where you have a better player who does, let's just say, does get a little laid off, right? Uh, maybe not to this degree. Maybe you know, a little, little longer in the backswing. Uh, maybe in a little laid off at the top. Are, are there some things where you're like, look, I'm not, we're not going to change that. We're going to leave it, okay? And we know that it's going to steepen a little. No, we know we got to manage it. We don't want it to steepen a ton, right? Um. What are are there some maintenance things that you would do to kind of help that in in way the like the body would work or some impact drills that would kind of help I, I guess not compensate but but help assist what you're kind of building in and letting go with the shaft. Yeah, and I would argue there's like three main things I would look at. Okay, and I'll relate two of them to John specifically. I think part of why it works for John and why it would work for another player who would have a similar position is his grip being weaker, not even because the wrist stays flexed, but because when the grip gets stronger, it's easier to pull down on the handle. you got to make sure you're not pulling down on this thing in transition when it's as laid off as it is. So grip being weaker, clubs more in the palm of your hands. It's a lot harder to put a vertical force down onto the club when mm. it's resting in the palm of your hand. Mm -hmm. We've seen that happen a lot. So personally, I think grip strength matters a lot here number two if you want to make this work the swing needs to be on the shorter side if the swing is really long and laid off there is a lot of time coming down when that shaft starts to steep in there's no amount of you that's going to control how much it steepens because there's so much time for it to keep happening mm -hmm. it's likely going to fall into a bad spot so the swing being shorter even if it's steep in some amount never really gets into a place of penalty because it doesn't have enough time to steepen enough to create a problem. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. Yep. So I think those two factors are really important for a guy like John. And in general, I think they're really important if you're going to make it work with the more laid off pattern. 
The third one is, in my case, if I were to work with a player and like they had a backswing, maybe not as exaggerated, but let's say somewhat similar to this, yeah. I likely wouldn't rely on a player needing so much rotation through the ball. Because the truth is, like if a player came to me and they said, hey, I, I can't really afford to turn very much, I have a physical limitation or whatever, that's fine. If anything, I can't put you in a very shallow position coming down because odds yeah. are if you can't turn and you're shallow, you're going to get stuck and hook the ball or shank it or create all sorts of messes. So having the club a little bit more laid off and it coming down a little steeper wouldn't be the end of the world for a player who can't necessarily turn super well through the golf ball. Well, it's just interesting to look at it. When you look at Rom there at the top, I mean, it's... It's very unique. I mean, It is. Real, it's very, it's very, very, very unique. Very, very few players on tour with a pattern like this. And to be completely honest, for good reason. You know, when I talk to amateur golfers and I always try to relate them to the tour, I'm always saying, don't look at... Like, look at the outliers and what they do specifically to make it work. That's fine. But mm -hmm. why do you think the masses of tour players have a specific aesthetic to their golf swing? It's mm -hmm. because that's the easiest way to play golf. I mean, I'm sorry, but you're not seeing 150 John Rahm looking golf swings on tour. No. There's a reason for that. You know, yeah, he's an outlier. He made it work. Most people wouldn't. It's as simple as that. All right. Here's another, I would say relatively outlier with with how steep that left arm is i mean there's some upright lead arms but man there's not many like that when we're, we're kind of starting to enter the world of jim ferrick and, and shaheen I, I gotta tell you you know i follow justin's i've been following justin's career for a long time i, I know as you have mm -hmm. and he posts a lot of video he gives us a lot to look at i I feel like his left arm continues to get more upright so my oh, question is like yeah, when does this thing get too upright well, I think two things. Number one, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm pretty sure Justin Thomas loves a fade as a stock shot. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. obviously the more upright lead arm lends itself to more of a fade bias in general. It's easier to fade the ball when the hands are so high. Number two, he's not somebody who rotates and stays super level with this pivot through the ball like you would see with a Victor Hovland or a, mm -hmm. I always like to relate it to old school Hunter Mayhem. If you remember how much he would just like spin out like a top, you know. Justin Thomas has a little more right side bend coming down. His left arm drops a little bit more in transition. Yeah. If you get his arm in anywhere near Rory's position and then it drops the way they do coming down, well, he's going to sling the ball or start to have a draw bias that he doesn't yeah. want to be seeing in general. So he'll often rehearse these like keeping the face more open, keeping the arm really out and up and away from him. In my opinion, this is to try to favor more of his fade preference. It also matches the right side bend coming down. And people always comment to me on social media about like how much his heel comes off the floor. I actually think when his heel comes up and his knee kicks in as aggressively as his does, it actually helps him kick him into some amount of right side bend, which helps offset, let's say, how high his hands how are. High so hands it, are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a way that it, it functions for him as a player. So... I think it benefits him due to the nature of how he transitions into the ball and his preference on ball flight. I think that's why it gets so high. All right. Now let's have the conversation for the amateur player, right? That upright of a left arm, that amount of toe hang at the top. I go back to what I said earlier, trying to develop an amateur, the 85%. It's a big ask, man. It's a big ask when you've got a job and a family, look, I practice once a week. I play once every two or three weeks. Is there a little easier way to kind of go about this? I mean, the answer is yes. Like an incentivizing a downswing that would make his life a little bit easier. Most of the upright lead arms that we see again with the amateurs and toe hangs and I got to tell you, I, I don't see this many upright left arms. I mean, like this is... No, this is extreme, of course. I mean, this, this is, extreme. This is yeah. extreme. But I see, you know, a lot of it kind of stems from also, Shaheen, and that inside take, you know, club head kind of gets in early, and then they go up. So they kind of go in and then up. Left wrist takes some, some extension, and then we know what it's inevitable from there. Like, they like they come over it. Mm -hmm. um, but, man, it's a big ask, right, for a, a 20 handicap saying, hey, man, I really want to get better at golf. Um and I really like Justin Thomas's left arm at the top. What do you think? Better like a fade. Yeah. Better like a fade. You know, the truth is when you're asking that question for everyday golfers, the first thing you have to say is like, what do you need to do coming down here? Not to hit a poor shot. Mm -hmm. You probably have to 
manipulate the club and the arm pretty differently, right? Like you can't just have everything come crashing down like a, like an ax onto the ball. So if you have to do a lot of changes in a short amount of time coming into the ball to hit a good shot, odds are you're not going to do it if you're not playing and practicing as often as a tour player is. That's yeah. the way I always like to relate it to people. So if we're saying, can you organically hit a good shot from here coming down? I mean, it depends how you transition to the ball, but most people aren't doing good things coming down. They usually steepen the club, you know, right. cut across it, poor sequence to the chest, spinning out, like a lot of, lot of bad habits. All right, so there's our six. So I think we're in agreement that Rory is our number one pick. Scotty is our number two pick. I think my least favorite is, I mean, I just, the ROM picture for me and how laid off that is, I just, I don't know, for a, for a mid handicap, like I'm not in. That's like, that's number, that's number six for me. Yeah, I mean, I I hate the idea of ranking golfers because they're so talented. But if we're, yeah, we're related, just saying patterns, patterns for yeah, amateur yeah. development, yeah, 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 patterns for amateur development, yeah, probably Rom Morikawa would be two that are kind of up there for me. Mm -hmm. I don't mind Victor, Victor and Justin are probably somewhere in the middle. I definitely think Rory is the. I say Victor three for me. I, I would say Rory one, Scotty two, Victor three. Um, I would probably go Morikawa for JT five, Rom six. Yeah, it's a, I mean, look, they all have things they do really well and they all have things that yeah. they don't do as well for, yeah. for uh, you know, the truth yeah. is at the end of the day, it doesn't even matter who you're ranking two to six. Rory is the clear cut. Uh, it's just a pattern that we're talking it's, about. Yeah, right? just, it's just, it's the best, it's the best visual pattern. Like the reality is you can take out all the names and faces and just put silhouettes of these positions. That's we right. Would them, that's we would right. rank them the same way. That's the one thing yep. that I want to make clear here. So, oh, yeah, for sure. um, yeah. you know, I think the, the best looking matchup for the everyday golfer is Rory. I think that's clear as day. Wow. It's good stuff, man. It's interesting, right? And you kind of go through the journey of teaching and you, um, you know, you, you listen to other coaches and you go to these seminars and you train and this and that. But really, at the end of the day, I think as a coach, we have a lot of coaches that listen to this pod, which I appreciate. Um, there's no substitute for getting in there and living it, though, as a coach and watching a pattern and then saying to yourself, OK, here are the changes we're going to make. We're going to go A, B and C, make the pattern change. And then what does that facilitate from there? what does that incentivize a student from there and then how does that journey go and then that and then that journey and that conversation can take you to a different place right and so you get experience with all of these different patterns in amateur golf and as you make adjustments you learn from that and what you can you know i think predict within fairly good reason on what is might going to happen right or probably is going to happen from there i uh, i uh I get a lot of questions from young coaches about like the development side of a coach and analyzing swings like this. I would argue two completely different benefits you would gain online coaching, video analysis. You learn how to analyze a swing from a purely technical point of view, as good as you sure. can, if you give a lot of online lessons and I'll obviously I've given my fair share. So I would know that if you want to learn the process of development, I think there's no substitute for the coaching side than just mm -hmm. being in a lesson with someone in person. Cause you see, yeah the ebbs and flows of their emotions. You see the ebbs and flows of where patterns go when they're feeling good, feeling not when you have to make subtle changes to a swing mid lesson, something's not working. What do you do in that spot? There's no way to recreate that unless you're in the mosh pit, as we call yeah. it, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. You got to get in, right. You got to get in the pit. You got to get in there. You're getting messy and, and you start, yeah. you start making changes and all of a sudden like, okay, more times than not, yeah, it's going pretty smooth. All right, club face looks better, shaft looks better. We're starting to see development in the pivot. Impact alignments are starting to improve. I'm incentivized and I feel good. This journey continues. He's hitting better shots. His not only is his ceiling elevating, but his floor is coming up with it. Um, but then sometimes you make the changes and then they start to look good, and all of a sudden then he shanks it, right? And and he starts moving a little closer right at the bottom. You're like, oh shit. Right. So now what you know, so now you got to kind of fast forward and kind of give them some impact maintenance and what's happening there, in addition to the context that you're giving them in the backswing. If, and so things yeah. happen and change. And, and and for the most part, it can be it can be very smooth. But then you get the curveballs and all of a sudden, like it 
it, you get, it can get a little uncomfortable and you got to work through it. And I think as you work through that, it really develops you as a teacher. Well, I think there's something that just needs to be said too, just in general for like, just because you're making a technical change, it doesn't necessarily mean your skill early on is going to improve with it. If anything, I would argue it's the opposite. You know, you feel very uncomfortable because you're doing yeah. something so different. Yeah. Your skill, your coordination, your athleticism usually diminishes slightly just in the early stages of making the swing change. And then everything kind of picks up together. Mm -hmm. Good stuff, man. This was awesome. Great conversation. I knew you'd be perfect for this. You, <laughs> you, you not only understand what you're doing, but you articulate it very well. Simple, digestible. I think that's key in today's game. Technology is important that it, we can look under the we can look under the cover and we can learn about, you know, what's happening with different patterns. But at the end of the day, I mean, this 85% is real, right? And they're consuming it. They love golf and they want to get better. They're just not going to show up on your lesson team. And, and, and they're never going to show up on your lesson team. It's just the way it is. And you can preach it all you want. Hey, the best way to learn is to go take a private lesson from someone that knows it, no doubt. But, but Shaheen, 85% are not going to do that. And that's a lot of people. And so if we can kind of get the narrative a little bit around that and they can, pick, they can pick up bits and pieces from this kind of discussion, I think there's value in that. Is it for everybody? No, but there is some value. And this discussion, folks, and I'll end with this, this discussion around what we just talked about for the amateur golfer is very different than Brandel's tweet. It's very different, right? It's the number one player in the world, the 0.000000001%, right? And that discussion around what the best players in the world do and what we see on TV um, this week in, in North Carolina and next week at the PGA at Valhalla is a very different, is a very different discussion than developing the 85%. Yeah. And that's, that's why I think you can't analyze those two things the same. You just yeah. can't. It's two different worlds. Shaheen, thank you. You're the man. Keep up the great work. Take care guys.